Welcome to a very special episode of the Wild Ones podcast, the show where we talk about bike stuff. I'm Jimmy, and I'm here with producer Emily and today's special guest, the one-armed Bradley Wiggins, <laughs> a.k.a. paracyclist Dan Richards. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Uh, hello. Thanks for having me. I mean, the one-armed Bradley Wiggins is literally a brand new one. I've taken the compliment. I hope he's not <laughs> offended. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I saw a picture of you. Uh, you've got a geezer accent, just like Bradley Wiggins. I've definitely seen a picture of you with a flat cap on, which I've also seen Bradley wearing. You ride bikes, he rides bikes. So there we go, one on Bradley Wiggins. I think I think he rode bikes better than I ever will. But yeah, I'll take the compliment. I'll take the comp- I love a compliment. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but riding bikes is riding bikes. It's all fine. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I mean, it's a, it's a brand new one. <laughs> I wonder if I could put that on my bio. Definitely, you should. I've, yeah. well, I've got... I've got my bio on Instagram has a quote from a YouTube comment from probably about six years ago where someone said, Jimmy, uh, oh, God, I can't even remember what it is. What is it? Um, the Tom Ford of cycling. Yeah, someone said, Jimmy's the Tom Ford of cycling. I'm like, <laughs> I'll take that and I will keep that forever. I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna put that, but then I'm going to turn, I'll turn up one day to do a talk or something. Uh, and I'll be like, yeah, the one I'm Bradley Wiggins. Who's calling him that? <laughs> Who's this? Who's this? Who's he think he is? Yeah, get him off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> one arm Bradley Wiggins. Who do you think he is? Yeah. <laughs> so Dan is a veteran and a mega strong cyclist who has raced across America and represented Great Britain in the Invictus Games. He also goes by another name, the one armed wonder. And that's because back in 2009, at the age of just 23, he was in a motorbike accident. When he woke up in hospital, he found out his right arm and shoulder had been amputated. From this point on, his life shifted dramatically, and what followed is an incredibly inspiring story of resilience. If you're struggling for motivation or looking for inspiration on goal setting or working through challenges, you're going to want to stick around for this episode because, believe it or not, in Dan's own words, losing his arm is the best thing that ever happened to him. Dan's story is so interesting, in fact, that we're going to skip the news this week and dive straight in. So, Dan, do you want to start from the beginning and tell us about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, thanks for the introduction. No bother. You tell it better than I can, and, I, and I've lived the story. <laughs> but um, yeah, as you said, um, losing my arm and my shoulder, yes, yeah, it's, it's the best thing that happened to me, um, which sounds really kind of like it deserves a couple of hashtags and a, <laughs> a cliche <laughs> caption to written after it. But no, I stand by it unequivocally. Um, obviously, when it happened... I didn't wake up in the hospital and they said, oh yeah, unfortunately your arm and shoulder's gone. I didn't go, oh, well, that's brilliant. You know what, it's going, to be, it's, it's going to be sausage and beans all day long, isn't it? So no, it was, it's always, it's always in hindsight. It's always in retrospect. I've been, I've, it, I've been able to, and it's afforded me uh, opportunities may or may not have been there. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I can't, I can't think in what if, I don't think in what if. Um, had it not have happened, I probably won't be, or I probably wouldn't have done even half the things that I've been fortunate and able to do. Um, and yeah, it's 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 been it's, it's it's been a character building number of years. I'm sure um, it has. I was going to say, do you want to start from the beginning? Your yeah. your sort of upbringing and how you got into the army and that kind yeah. Of thing. So I was brought up. I was brought up in. I guess a military family. My, 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 my dad was in the army. Well, my biological father was in the army. Um, I don't have a relationship with him. Um, um, I think it's, it's a mutual thing. Before we carry on, as well, for ease of conversation, when I mention my dad, officially, it's my stepdad, but he's my dad. He's the only person I've known as dad. But um, my dad was in the army. So when mum met my dad, I was four. And... Um, he was in the army. I grew up in a little town called Tidworth, a massive garrison town. And I used to just watch him go out to work in his uniform and, and whatnot and you know, see all his friends and stuff. And I was eight years old when I told mum and dad, you know, when I'm old enough, that's, I'm going to be like dad and join the army. And, and, and I guess you know, looking back on it, that gave me the, the, the direction that I needed in life. I, I knew from a very early age what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be. And for the most part, as I got older, what I needed to do to get there. 
I don't get me wrong. I was toying around with, you know, any kid would do like, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a vet. I'm going to be an astronaut and all this stuff. Um, but it all, I always came back to being in the military, yeah. being in the army or, or, or whatever. And um, yeah, I was 17 when I left home for the first time for anything longer than a weekend. And that was to go basic training. How did you find school? School was not very good. Yeah, only small <laughs> then. <laughs> um, I didn't, I didn't enjoy school. I couldn't wait to leave. I was bullied relentlessly. I was the tallest in my year. Um, and um, my ears, I kind of grew into my ears. So um, there was a kid at school called Richard Roberts, who was a lot smaller than me, shorter than me. And um, his nickname for me from years eight through to 11 was the lanky big ears twat. Oh my gosh. Um, original yeah don't mint your words <laughs> but um yeah he uh yeah he made my life misery in school school is savage isn't it yeah and I, I didn't i didn't i just didn't enjoy it i was a very shy boy yeah growing up very shy um very quiet I had my own little group of friends kept myself to myself i rode a bike to school uh, and whatnot and i was I used, to, I used to race myself to school it's about a three mile journey to school but then obviously being a kid and certainly growing up, you know, hitting puberty and stuff, you stink for the rest of the day of BO as it just, it just, it just <laughs> begins to find its way to your armpits, doesn't it? So, um, yeah, it was, um, I didn't enjoy school, no. But do you know what? I, I found out later on in, you know, later on in life a few years ago that that, that boy, um, he he's no longer with us. He, he uh, was having a bad time of, of life and, so it's kind of one of those things where you, I think it doesn't condone it. Like I hate bullies, one bullies and thieves, uh, it's my biggest hates in the world. But it kind of, I guess, in a way, bullies bully people because they're having a bit of a time of it in their own life, and and they feel better. They make feel better by bullying other people, and it's yeah, it's. It's you take one and give it the other, didn't you? So I I forgave it. I forgave when I found out. I was like, oh, do you know what? I'm not going to live with that anymore. Like, yeah. So a bit deep, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a bit deep for early on. So you went. So you left school and you went into the army at 17. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do in the army. Like I just knew I wanted to be in it. Uh, and one thing that Dad always told me growing up, and certainly the day I left for for, for, for the army as well was um, if this is what you're going to do with your life, make sure you find, you pick a trade so that when you leave, you've got something to fall back on. You can build a career in something else when you do leave, whether that's after four years or, or 22 years. So I ended up joining a regiment called the King Street Royal Horse Artillery. And it is a mount, they call it mounted regiment. So you're, you're mounted on horseback. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about the equine world, how to ride a horse, anything. But when it was, when, when the dream was sold to me in basic training, <laughs> um, I said, what trades are there? And they reeled a few off and they were like Taylor and Storman. And, and they said, Farrier. I said, what's a Farrier? He said, it's a blacksmith. I said, say no more. <laughs> I like the sound. I researched it a bit and then sort of found out you know, at 17, really, I was in, in the middle of basic training. I was, you know, as a farrier, I could make a pretty good living for myself, have my own business and hopefully retire relatively young. So I, I kind of went, I, I, joined, I joined this King Street then and uh, with the sole purpose of becoming a farrier. But then and I wanted world experience and life experience. And, and the army is, or the military is many things but you will get a lot of world experience and you'll get a lot of life experience and you'll be put in situations where you're forced to grow up pretty quickly um i it never sat right with me in in in, in my younger years of joining the military just to pat horses i called it like <laughs> so in 2007 went off to afghanistan spent sort of six seven months there came back from that Found myself trekking the pool in the Himalayas. Came back from that, and that was two, that the, the end of two thousand and eight. You, you definitely got to your wish of 
some life experience and seeing the world then. Yeah, I mean, Afghanistan was, yeah. Afghanistan as a country is a very, is a very beautiful country, very mountainous. Well, it's kind of on like a bit of a plateau. So at the, the northern end, so the Kabul way, it's like 10,000 feet above sea level. And then you've got down south, sort of towards like Pakistan and so on, Helmand province. It's very sort of low. Um, and so the weather is very, very different. It's freezing cold in the winter in Kabul. Well, it's freezing cold in, in the south as well, but between the two, it's a lot colder up north. Um, and the pool as well was like, I remember, I remember flying into into Kathmandu and, and this is pre-earthquake as well. So Kathmandu had a really bad earthquake, I think in 2012, I think it was. And like Nepal is at the time, I don't know about now, but Nepal at the time was classed as a third world developing country. And in both scenarios, Afghanistan and Nepal, you got to see children with absolutely nothing really happy and it kind of puts into perspective what we take for granted mm. you know if your amazon pass doesn't turn up because you've paid for a prime membership which ensures your package gets delivered you know tomorrow or by 10 o'clock tonight and it's like come on like mm -hmm. yeah it's it's it puts a lot of things into perspective and, and realigns your values and what you do value I'm by no means a saint, by the way. Like, yeah, I do get really angry. Not angry. I get really annoyed when something doesn't go. Amazon doesn't show up. <laughs> when Amazon doesn't show up, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's so you you do get a lot of life experience, world experience, and you are forced to grow up pretty quickly. I mean, I grew up pretty quickly in Afghanistan. Yeah, I bet. But I wasn't a front line. I wasn't on the front line. I was I was working I was with the indigenous population. Uh, who wanted to be interpreters. Yeah, but those were my prerequisite boxes for becoming a farrier. I wanted to do them before I sort of became, before I wanted to kind of entertain that avenue. And I came back from Nepal and, and said, this is what I want to do. So I'm only in the King Street for this reason. And they were like, look, if that's what you want to do, fair enough, but we need to get um, Queen's Birthday Parade out of the way. And this was, it was Queen's Birthday Parade 2009, or Troop in the Colour that it's known as as well. And um, I did, there, there, there's, re, there's, there's one rehearsal and then there's two reviews before the actual one. I did what I did the first review, full dress review on the 30th of May, 2009. And on Sunday, the 31st of May, 2009, I was involved in the collision with the Central Reservation, riding back to St. John's with Barracks and uh, presented with a set of circumstances which kind of dictated the rest of my life. So... <laughs> Almost the most shocking thing about your entire story is that you served in the military in Afghanistan yeah. in an active war, whatever the correct term is for what was going on there, and that isn't the reason that you have one up. It's ironic, isn't it? I do <laughs> consider myself quite lucky, though, that I, I wasn't blown up or, yeah. or, or anything. Um, there are a few people when in the early days of my injury who I was in, in my regiment um, because I was going down this route of uh, help for heroes and so on and and the, and the various benefits of being an amputee as part of the military um, uh, uh, who took it upon themselves to kind of ensure that I wasn't telling people that I'd been blown up right? as if like, I was taking glory from it. Right. Yeah, f*** them guys. Um, sorry, um, but call it what you want. I, mean, I was in a motorcycle accident right back to the barracks. Probably happened because I was being a bit daft, being a bit stupid. But, you know, people make mistakes. And there's a few people that liked to... What, diminish it? Or diminish yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Um, because it didn't happen in active service. Yeah, of yeah. Sense. And like... At the end of the day, it still happened. I mean, yeah, exactly. So, and it was why as well, when Help for Heroes first approached me at Headley Court, which at the time was the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre, I actually refused the help. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not a hero help for heroes like i've not been injured on tour and that's when they you know chap called mark elliott who is still with help for heroes who helped set it up he said to stop being stupid you know here's the help you need the if you want the help take it that's great and so yeah i i owe a lot to that initial footstep into that side of it to mark elliott 
from Help for Heroes. Can you talk a little bit about the extent of the injuries? Yeah, so I've got no memory of the accident whatsoever. I don't, I don't get flashbacks or anything. Um, but I had hit the central reservation shoulder first. Um, and it was, it was on the A41, the Hendon, southbound Hendon Way on a long sweeping corner. And um, there's on that road, if anyone that knows it, on that road, there's a fence that goes, that, so you've got the, the barrier and there's a fence that goes down the middle. And I hit the fence where two panels meet and it's solid steel, oh. where two panels meet in the middle, um, shoulder first, which ripped my arm and shoulder off on sight. And you had full leathers on as well, didn't you? I had full leathers on, bust the leathers open, but the zip was still done up. Wow. So it's a good zip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, ripped my arm and shoulder off on site, pretty much. Um, broke both my ankles. My left, my left forearm was uh, snapped in uh, various places to the point where Owen, who was a paramedic, said your hand was cupping your elbow. Um, and we had to pull that straight before we could put the drugs in. Mm. I can't remember any of this. Thankfully. But they put me into the coma in the road, um, intubated me on site. Uh, because I had severed my brachial plexus out of my spinal column and lacerated my internal jugular. So I was profusely bleeding. There's a chap with me, a friend, a friend from the military called Alan, who, uh, who saved my life really. Um, um, he sort of controlled my blood flow at the scene before the police and the paramedics turned up. Um, and yeah put into the coma and I, when I when I when I came out of the coma in the Royal London and Whitechapel that's when I kind of realized the extent of what, what happened I thought I was waking up in my barracks in the room you know that, that however long I was in that coma for I think it was a day or two um I can't I can't recollect obviously I was put into the coma but the last vivid memory I've got is we were filtering away we were filtering through traffic some traffic lights and I was at the front and as I got kind of a car in half length from the front car the lights turned green cars were moving off dual carriageway so I just pulled the throttle back to get out of the way filtering through and yeah it's in the outside lane of the dual carriageway and yeah whatever happened happens so don't know how it happened don't know why it happened the police don't know what happened but I, I said I'm, I'm pretty sure I was going probably a bit too fast um, for my abilities and paid the price for it. But you know, you learn from your mistakes and yeah, so mm -hmm. play stupid games and you win stupid prizes. Yeah, this is it. And the age of 23 as well, you know. Yeah, you... so it's a very, it's, it's a massive shock to the system. I don't regret it happening. And like, like you said at the beginning, it's probably the greatest thing that happened to me. But I imagine that in the immediate aftermath of that, that is not what you're feeling. No, do you know what? So I was... Brought around from the coma. Um, and I remember my mum and dad peering, out, peering over me. And in my room in the barracks, which is a tiny little room, which I didn't have to share with anyone, my bed was right next to the wall. And so I can understand why my dad was stood on the right, because to the right it was the door and the rest of my room. But my mum being stood on the left... I was thinking, how are you stood there? Because there's no space. There's no space. Like, <laughs> literally, my bed's here, my window's there. But then I've got that, I'm hit by the the kind of, the anesthetic, peppery taste of anesthetic in the back of my throat. Obviously, I've, I've been in hospital, but I've had operations before, so I recognise I, I recognize that, that kind of sensation. So then I'm thinking, well, something bad has happened. I don't know what, I don't know why I'm here. I need to go put my motorbike away. And that's when it's like, you haven't got a bike. It's... So I thought someone had pinched it and stolen it. And then the doctor came in and that's when he sort of started at the bottom of the bed. I can see my feet were in casts. So I thought I'd broken both my legs. And how the hell I broke them? He said, you've got two broken ankles. The left one would need to be sitting with pins. Um, and then he came up to the left. And as he came up, I've noticed like, a blue foam cast. In it is my arm look into it and there's like external fixators into my like scaffolding. He said, you've, uh, you've severely fractured your radius and your ulna. 
you all need plates to reset that. Um, so that you think, oh, right, broken arm, broken broken ankles, right, we can, we can live with that. It's not much really. And then he walked back down. I remember he walked back down, round, round the bottom, and then back up the right. And so I'm watching him. And as I'm watching him, he said, but unfortunately, and any sentence, it doesn't matter the situation that starts with unfortunately, you know isn't really going to bode too well. Unfortunately, after six and a half hours of surgery, we were unable to save your... And it's, it's time kind of slowed down. Um, we were unable to save your right arm and shoulder. And I remember looking down and where this should have been was the pillow. There was nothing, it wasn't, it wasn't there. And that's when I kind of, that's when it hit home. It was like a massive shock to the system. Mm. And, um, and I got a bit upset and obviously anyone would. But at 23, and I think being that young as well and being that young in life in general, vanity is a massive part of your life anyway. Um, and I just remember thinking at the time, how bad a situation this is but then you're thinking like who's gonna want me now do you know what i mean like i'm gonna yeah no, girls aren't gonna find me attractive because i'm i look weird and and all of this and 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 so it's all just it all just it's like a ball that's being rolled down like a snowball being rolled down it just gets bigger and bigger as it goes down so i was upset and and whatnot and then for some reason, I remember this verbatim, and the nurse was sort of stood here. And I said, I, I grabbed her gown. And I went, is the plumbing still attached and working? <laughs> and she went, oh, well, that's fine. You've got a catheter hanging out of it. But other than that, it's fine. I went, do you know what? Nothing else really matters, does it? There's people worse off than me. And it got a few laughs. Looking back on that moment, that's the moment I can wholeheartedly say is the moment I accepted my situation for what it was. This is the situation. Okay, my arm's never coming back. I'm going to be a man with one arm for the rest of my life. What's involved with this? Probably about a week or two later, it's wheeled into the toilet. I'm non-weight bearing as well. And I just had an enema. I've never felt any more vulnerable in my life than having that. But, but they wheeled me into the toilet 23 years old and they said when you're finished pull the orange cord and someone will come in and tidy you up I, I just went you know if I can't wipe my own ass and I've got the ability I've got the ability to be able to do so I need to have a strongly worded word with myself and so I spent an hour and a half in that toilet my hand was I had my arm was reset at this point and so I had I had my fingers and to, to use I spent an hour and a half wiping my own ass and they said when you pull the orange cord and they went I said, no. I was like, I need my independence back. And that was the first goal I ever set mm. post-injury. There's so much involved with independence. It's not just writing. It's not just doing buttons and shoelaces and so on. It's so much more. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was you know, I just figured I've got all this time in hospital now. I was in hospital for two months all up in two different hospitals. And um, in, I, was, I just figured, you know, I've got all this time in between visiting hours I can sit here and fester like some kind and feel sorry for myself or I can just pull my shit together and just get on with this new way of life. And uh, I had plastic boots, plastic boots over my casts because I had my ankles, my left ankle was reset with pins and a handyman came in and, and I just said, oh, I said, can you drill me some holes in these boots, please? And I can have a bit of string. He said, what for? I said, look, I was right-hand dominant. I'm now left-handed, not by choice, but um, I wanted to, to tie shoelaces. And so in between visiting hours, I would just, I'd learn to write again, like learn to write. Uh, I'd, I'd try and learn to do shoelaces and whatnot. And I got someone to bring me a shirt in. So I'd learn to do buttons up on a shirt. That's, that's incredible, especially at that age. And to have gone through what you've gone through just to, well, to, to be that focused on living, you know, that focused on, I, ha I have to do this stuff so that I can continue to live and be a normal functioning human being. It's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. I just, I just thank you. Um, I just think that throughout life, you're always going to come to junctions. 
And, you know, people always say, oh, no, you can, there's, there's three or there's four, there's not, there's two. There is, there is two directions. Yes or no, right or wrong. When you start adding others in, you go, oh, what about I don't know? I don't know is irrelevant. Maybe it's irrelevant. It's like, make a decision, go with it. And for me, that was, I can be a victim of my situation or I can just get on with it, adapt this new way of life. Because uh, I'm not about woe is me. I'm not about, like I said, there's people worse off than me. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't live with a terminal illness. I don't live in a war torn country. You know, I, it's, I am alive. So, and, and I, you know, this sounds really wanky and cliche, but time owes you absolutely nothing. Life owes you absolutely nothing. You owe life and time everything you can give it. And so I was like, I want to be a man with one arm for the rest of my life. My arm's never coming back. Um, so that's a situation. What are you going to do about it? I'm not going to be a victim. So sympathy is all well and good and adds a purpose as part of a process. But at some point you have to leave the sympathy behind and you have to you know, pull yourself together. You really do have to pull yourself together. You know, take the shit with the sand, or sorry, take the rough with the smooth and go with the hand that you're dealt, whether you like it or not, you know. That's just the way, that's, 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 that's my outlook on life. It's taken trauma and trauma isn't just about losing a limb. There's, there's so many different facets of trauma. My trauma has dealt me this hand so I can, I can make the choice of, of, of putting my hand down or I can just play the hand I'm dealt. Which I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that this all sounds cliche. Oh, it's, e it's easy for you. No, no, it's easy for anyone. You've just got to be, I've become a person as a result of this. That if I can't control the influence on the outcome of a situation, and I'm ruthless about this, I do not waste my time, effort or energy in trying to. And that people, I've spoken to people about it before and they've gone, oh yeah, it's easy said and done. No, 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 no. It is easy to do. You might not like the situation you've got, but at the end of the day, if you can't, why, why, why waste your time trying to fix something that can't be fixed at that moment in time? Maybe later on, we will come to that. What can you do? There's always something that can, there's always something that can be done. There's a good saying that's like, um, control the things you can change and accept the things you can't. Yeah. It might even be part of the Alcoholics Anonymous pledge or something but yeah. it's, it's that kind of idea isn't it it's, yeah you, you dealt the hand you dealt yeah. and you have to be able to roll with it and do the best you can kind of thing yeah you, you've, you've got to roll with the punches you you have to you have to and there's that there's that there's that thing isn't there is it is it what, 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 what rocky film is that from it doesn't matter how many how, how many times you get hit. It's about how many times you can get hit down and keep getting back up. Yeah. Denzel Washington says something similar, and he says, "You fall down seven times, get up eight. I love I love that. That's one of my favourite quotes. <laughs> so after the accident, you obviously yeah. had a couple of well, many months presumably of rehab. What you were presumably still in the army at that point. Yeah. So what happened with going back to the army? So I um I was given in hospital. I was given the option. Um, you know, if you want to leave, you can. But my attitude was, I'm not going to leave. I'm not leaving. Um, the army, the military is all I wanted to do growing up. I'm not going to let one bad day dictate the rest of my life. Um, so I said, I'm going to go to rehab with the goal of returning back to my regiment and and finding something to do. I found out pretty quickly I was never going to be a farrier. Uh, you can adapt things so much, but the reality of that trade is, is you, you, you need, at very least, I needed a residual limb. I haven't got that. Um, I tried to make a hoof pick, um, a very basic hoof pick, take a piece of metal, heat it up, and bend it into an S, an S-shaped thing. I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't hold it still. I could hold it still, but I can't hammer it. You know, and if you're trying to do that with a horse, it's moving around and so on. Yeah. Ain't happening. So um, I I accepted that. But I thought, you know, there's other things I can do. You know, the, there's the stores. You know, there's, there's various other things I can do. But at the time, the military were going through, the, the MOD were going through the cutbacks and the army was taking the biggest. And 
essentially you have to do two roles obviously your job but everyone's trained in the army whether you are uh whether you're a chef or a clerk or anything in between uh, a frontline infantry soldier you, you, your basic training is about teaching you the basics of soldiering um i couldn't do that i can't run my weight so i can't wear a bergen um I, I can't carry a rifle i can't fire a rifle um so yeah it was, it was kind of like i could just do one job and so i I was I stayed in the military for three years, relearned to ride a horse, got my fitness back, because I was quite aware that you know I've got this disability now. I don't want to be a sympathy case, and I'm certainly not going to be, you know, military or not. I'm I'm not going to be someone that just sits on the side collecting dust, feeling sorry for myself, and 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 being a waster, so to speak. So I uh, so I worked on my fitness, got my fitness back. Um, I couldn't do press ups or pull ups or, or anything, but I can run a mile and a half. I can do sit ups. I can carry weight in one hand. So we'll work on those things, and that's about controlling the controllables. But yeah, three years later, I went from I went in for a medical board, which I had every year, and every year it was it was it was there. I was told I was it was shown that I was really going above and beyond to sort of. I guess earn my earn my space as part of the military, but this 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 one I went in it was a bit different. There was more people saying there, and the crux of it really was the minute you leave this room, you're no longer insured to do anything military ever again, including making cups of tea for anyone other than yourself. So that was it. And that was that was the that was the the twelfth of March two thousand and twelve. I was in Frimley Park Hospital on the thirteenth of March having my left ankle fused and and the 14th of March I was in uh, Help for Heroes Recovery Centre, Tedworth House, going through the six month transition period between leaving the military, or between you know walking out of the camp gates for the last time and then entering the world of, we call it, we call it Civvy Street. Mm -hmm. So was this exciting to start something new or is it the opposite? The, the first year of, well, it was eight months of leaving the army are uh, probably the worst eight months of this entire situation that I found myself in. You know, I, I thought to myself, I'm going to have a month off to unwind. I've been used to living, you know, routine every single day, knowing I, I knew every single day what time I had to be somewhere in what, in what, in what order address and, and what I had to do. And now I've, that's all taken away from me and it's kind of, I've got free reign if you like. So I wanted to kind of get used to that. I thought a month is enough. I, I, I had money saved up over the years. I, I got bored after two weeks. Um, so I began applying for work and this is when everything began to spiral downhill. That eight months became 327 job applications of which not one led to anything, anything sub basic, not even a networking opportunity. I probably had five replies. And this is what was the most disheartening about it. I had five, and it was five replies. Um, one of which is from a cleaning job. Um, I haven't got the skills or experiences that you require. And you just think, you know, I've, I've, I've been to Afghanistan, you know, I've, I've, I've dealt with multilingual multicultural situations you know i've 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 been a line manager you know i've i've led i i've i've been a i've been a manager for people and you're saying i haven't got the skills experience to clean a, a toilet come on but i mean this is this is this towards the end of it you know but running parallel with those with all the rejection you know i was living on my savings on my you know the money i'd saved up i had a car i had to get rid of that um because I couldn't afford to run it. And I remember the morning, it was August. And uh, I had to re-tax and reinsure my car. And so I went to pay for it online. And um, my car declined. Did it again, it declined. Checked my online banking. I had 15 pence to my name. It, everything had gone. Um, and yeah, mum and dad got out to work. Mum and her new husband, my stepdad, had, had gone out to work that morning. And... Uh, I saw my reflection in the mirror and I was just like, if this is what life's got in store for me after everything I've been through, 
I, I really, I really rather not be part of it, you know. And I just weighed everything up, you know. 27 years old at the time, I've got no money, I can't get a job, no matter how hard I try. Um, every door is slammed, that like, literally slammed in my face. Um, I live at home with essentially mum and dad uh, in effectively my old room, whilst most people my age are getting well established in their careers, probably on the housing ladder by now, starting families, and I'm living at 27 like a 16-year-old kid. What have I really got to look forward to? And this is what life's got installed for me. I, I, I don't want to be part of it. Part way through doing that, uh, I um, had this thought of mum finding me, coming home from work, mum finding me in my room. And I was like, I need to go back to London. I need to go back to London. Like rock bottom is an awful place to be in, regardless of the situation. It really is. And, and, and you know, I'm not the only one that's been there. I imagine you guys have been there at various points. You know, like anyone listening has been at rock bottom for whatever reason. Um, what I have found with my rock bottom was how much more clearer decisions were to make. I need to get back to London. I don't know. I don't know how that even came about. I guess I'd spent my military career in London, so I knew London relatively well, but I also knew that's where the opportunities lie. Um, Did you ever tell your mum? I mean, I'm guessing she's listened. You've talked about this on other podcasts. I'm guessing she knows now. Did you tell her at the time? I felt really bad about it. Um, I felt ashamed yeah. by it. And it, uh, yeah, I think initially I felt, I told mum three years later, how bad it got. And, and I saw how bad that, how much it ruined her. Like really, really, it would upset any parent, it upset any parent mm -hmm. you know, that, that loves their kids. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, I think now I choose to talk about it quite openly because it should be spoken about. The conversation around it, and and the, and 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 the the factors that lead to awful decisions like that should be normalised, should be widely spoken about. Because certainly as men, and it's better. The conversation is a lot better now. The talk around mental health, it, it, it's it's no longer a subject which is kind of seen as a taboo topic. I think it should be normalised. It should be spoken about. And so, you know, I have a, I have a, you know, a presence, if you like, a very, a very small presence on social media. You know, and whilst I don't rub it in people's faces, it's part of my story. And every kind of chapter in my story, from losing the arm to the suicide attempt, and everything in between, is an asset to the life of Dan, if you like. And, and if people can take something from my experiences, even if it's just one person, and that is, that is, that is, that is the, the, you know, the, 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 the saying, isn't it? If I can help one person, brilliant. But it's absolutely true. Because it's one more person that deserves to be in the world, that deserves to be in a loving family, and it deserves to be around their friends and family. Because believe it or not, the world is a better place because, yeah, I get a bit upset. Yeah. Because you're in it. Absolutely. Yeah. And you deserve to stick around to see your life get back on track, which you never would have. And you're in an amazing position today and you never would have been able to see that otherwise. Yeah. So I'm sorry. And we're, and we're yeah. both going to get upset. Should we have a break? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for that brief interlude. We had to have a little break, didn't we? Um, Thankfully, I'm wearing waterproof mascara today. But if you have been affected by anything that we just talked about in that section, then please know that you can get help. You can go to the samaritans.org or mind.org.uk. Or if you feel that your life is in danger, you can ring 999. Let's move on to some happier parts. Thank you very much for telling us about that stuff. I know it's very heavy. Nice. Let's talk about your next chapter, which is you became a chauffeur, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, it's ironic, really. It's like a, in like, in like a twist of fate, like my lowest ebb, things kind of began to fall into place. I wanted to get back to London and I'd been offered a job as a chauffeur with this startup company called Capstar. Um, 
set up by two military officers uh, and their remit was employing the veteran community with a, with a with a percentage of the workforce being what 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 we call wounded injured and sick so people that have been injured as part of or during the service um which i i, I fall into that category um and i i'd moved into a spare room of a, a friend's house uh, and i stayed there for about six months it was in wokenham um and then i had to leave and found myself in a little village just outside windsor called raysbury um, and i lived there in this very small it's like a static home like a hol- you know, holiday homes mm-hmm. that you get one of those but i mean this thing was awful like it leaked had holes in it um the only luxury and this is this is this this was a luxury was it was it was plumbed into the grid so i could flush the toilet and run the taps and not have to wait for the the cesspit guy to come and <laughs> sort me out you know what i mean so um but you know i was coming out of a very i was coming out of a financial situation so i was driving these people around and i was surrounded by affluence and success and on some occasions you know fame and celebrity as well Th- that being the people that you were chauffeuring around yeah, I was chauffeuring yeah yeah and towards the end of that job actually it was eight of us we were hired help for the royal muse so we were the royal muse is like you know the, the transportation for the royal family and so on um and how i was living you couldn't get paid up as if you tried um you know, i was living pretty much apart if it weren't for the caravan i'd be homeless um but like how i was living versus the people that were sat in my car um yeah it was polar opposites it was i mean no one had any idea um because every day i turn up to work my, my my shirts were ironed my suit was clean my shoes were shiny and you know as awful as that caravan was i kept it clean and tidy and you know it was it was the same we had in the military and it's like if you got somewhere there uh, if you got somewhere to and sleep you're right well the caravan provided that so but i couldn't afford in the winter to keep it warm um i couldn't afford the gas canisters and there were some months as well that i couldn't afford to go shopping um like get the you know fill my cupboards up um so i i I'd, I'd live as far into the month on my paycheck as i could um you know, but 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 then this is it you know my bills are all paid so as long as so long as where i was living was you know um looked after everything else is kind of secondary and it you know sometimes it'd be i think the most it was like two weeks week and a half i'd live on custard cream biscuits and cups of tea um because the custard creams would fill me up breakfast lunch and dinner until i got paid um there were some charities there were a couple of charities that helped me out uh small ones like the veterans charity and so on um and it's only because they kind of met me and so on or i met up with the founder various kind of things that he happened to be at with his with his um uh, trailer his charity trailer um you know, a couple of times i get a knock at the door i had been asked the delivery uh home shopping delivery would turn up and i'd have i'd have i'd have tins and and, and long life things to fill my cupboards up you know for i don't have to worry about going shopping but being surrounded by these you know the clients you know seeing affluence and success on the level i'd never kind of encountered in my life before or since um but i remember like sitting in that caravan with my custard cream biscuits right underneath terminal five uh, like flight path like every 90 seconds my my tv signal would drop out because there's a plane flew over um i'm pretty sure there's tire marks on the on the roof of that caravan i don't know but um i just thinking this is this is awful there's got to be something better than this and and one day i don't know what it was but i just i just wanted to know the people that are sat in my car you know no matter how famous they are or how 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 rich they are and whatever like what are they doing when no one else is looking that's giving them their get up and go and i think that's the important bit it's the self-validation when no one else when there's no cameras when there's no audience when there's no when it's just you in a car 
Because if it's working for them, why can't it work for me? And I began to cherry pick kind of personality attributes, motivations. And I guess I couldn't give you the list of what it was, but it, it transpired to give it a, a topic area. It was the value of time. What can I do before I start work to make my day a little bit easier or a little bit more productive and so on? And, you know, I remember I worked with one person. I was, I was, I was seconded to one person who worked in the city and um, three days a week, his schedule was he was at the gym, but his gym was at like six in the morning. So then I, I used to get up and ready and then turn up at the address on time. But then he's getting up two, three hours before he needs to be in the office to go in, you know, on this three days a week or whatever to go to the gym. I was like, hang on a minute. If he's doing this before his day starts, why can't I? Sometimes it's, you know, it's not feasible because it's ridiculous time in the morning. But I said, well, if I can get up like two hours early and go walk for a walk around Raysbury before I have to get in the car. And what I did find was I was so much more awake and ready for the day after a 15, 20, 30 minute walk around the village. I just decided one day, you know what, any opportunity I get from now on, I don't care what it is. I don't care if I can do it or not. I'm just going to say yes. And I've written myself off for so much in the past. Like, oh, I can't do that because of X or, or what, what are my friends going to say? What are my friends in the army going to say if they see me trying to do this? They're going to think I'm stupid. Like, what's the point? And I was like, oh, no. And the beauty of it is saying yes to something will put you on a path to something else. It'll open other doors, whether it's one door or multiple doors. Um, the opportunity is the key to open that door. And that door would never appear if, if, if it hadn't have happened. Speaking in cliches and, and, <laughs> and, and, and quotes now, but... I, I think as well, the more things that you try and the more things that you do, the more you learn what you don't want to do going forward as well. Yeah. So like you have to, you have to do stuff to know what path you want to take. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, um, and so after that kind of epiphany, if you like... Um, you know, I was I was taken away to Egypt, and I qualified as a scuba diver with you know, a paddy open water scuba diver. Um, nothing was adapted for me. It was with a charity called Depth Therapy, which I think now, unfortunately, they've had to. I don't I don't think they operate as a charity anymore. Um, they've done they do such amazing work. The guy that ran it was a chap called Richard Cullen, Doctor Richard Cullen, um, uh, who found that being underwater. And this plays into the hand of sport as a tool anyway, but being underwater, regardless of your limitations, whether you can't move below the waist or whatever, or if you've got limbs missing, you're equal. And I think that's the beauty of sport in general. It's jumping ahead now, but um, you're in a near weightless environment. There is, There are no barriers. I had to adapt, and I think that's the important thing as well. It's like you, you can adapt so much in life, but you have to adapt to the world as well. Like if you expect the world to adapt to you, you're going to be very, very, very disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And if you, and it, uh, this is probably going to come out really badly, but people that have that mindset, I haven't got the time of day for. I really haven't. Like and, until they come to that decision, they go, I need to do this. I need to do X, Y, and Z to not get by in life, but to get a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Rather than expecting the world to come to you. Yeah. And so I did, I did that. And then, um, I found myself learning to wing walk. Uh, not learning to, I gave it a go. Um, that led to learning to fly a plane. I didn't get a license though. Um, imagine me flying a plane, but um, <laughs> commercially. <laughs> I come out of the cockpit, you know, no passengers. <laughs> but um, through doing all of this and saying yes to various things, there's, there's, there's more to the decision I was listening to an audio book and it was Richard Branson's audio book, um, Losing My Virginity, how he came up with Virgin. And, um, <laughs> That's a good name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a quote in it. I've never forgotten this. There is nothing more expensive in life than a missed opportunity. It really isn't. Um, and after the plane, and this is, this, this is two, this is the back of 2014 now. Um, there was an opportunity came around to 
go through the selection process of becoming part of a four-man crew of the world's first all-disabled crew to row unsupported across the Atlantic Ocean. I knew nothing about rowing. Um, and I went, I'll give it a go. Like, it's a string to the bow. It's a chapter to the book, the proverbial book. Um, we could go and see how far we get. And it was a year. It was a, it was a whole year. And I lent myself to the process. Uh, I think there's about 20 of us, 30. I can't remember how many it was. It was a few of us. And um, I was the only upper limb amputee. Um, everyone else was like below and above knee amputees. And over the course of the year, you know, I was, you know, the, the, the group got progressively smaller. And um, I made it to the final five, of which four were chosen. And I was number five. Um, I, I, I did the final selection with three of the selected four crew. And there was a little bit of arrogance about it. I've definitely got this, you know. Um, uh, no, I got the phone call. I just said, yeah, um, thank you for everything you've done. Um, we're going to go with someone else. I wasn't disheartened about it at all. Um, and there's a reason for that. But I put the phone down and I went, well, I need something else to do. And I had a bike and I had the, it was, a, it was an entry level Scott Speedster, which was given to me um, by, by, by Health for Heroes. And um, I went, give cycling a go. And that was it. But the thing that I got out of the row was ultimately. I got to see what I'm capable of in spite of my own limitations and in spite of, and there were plenty of them, naysayers, you know, people trying to shit on your dreams and stuff. And I carried on with it in spite of that. And so when I got into the cycling and I did a ride across France, having never watched the Tour de France in my life before, and every time I'd been to France, was in a car or a bus, it was always flat, pan flat. You could see for miles. <laughs> So when they said, uh, it was a ride with Help for Heroes, I'm, do, I'm doing the ride again in June, actually, but um, as an ambassador, but um, I did, I got to France thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be brilliant. Started in Belgium, finished in Verdun, right? It's going to be flat, it's going to be nice and easy. Literally, first day, I don't know how many hills we did. I was going to turn around going, who the hell planned this route out? Like, because they're having a laugh. It's probably uh, worth saying as well. I remember I was listening to another passage podcast you're on where you were talking about hills and one of the things people might not realize is you really need two arms to be able to support yourself when you're outside sorry yeah. when you're up off the saddle up yeah. a hill so really you you aren't able to get out of the saddle when you're up a hill you have to yeah so i, I can't stand up and cycle yeah at all at, uh, only if i'm not pedaling ah of course yeah yeah, yeah. um so I, I can freewheel and stand up you know bit of respite <laughs> um the thing i got from the row about not giving up right every hill i came to then and now and during i i never got off and walked my attitude was there'll be a nice view at the top of this hill if i can get off and walk because it got a little bit hard i wouldn't have earned it i would i, I wouldn't have earned the, the view i wouldn't have earned you know, the feeling of success, if you like, which is a very kind of polarized way of looking at it. But again, this is how I motivate, my, motivate myself. Um, and so I, I, I didn't, I, I never got off and walked once. I probably got off and stopped and then got back on. Um, but when I got to Verdun and it was a French war grave memorial for World War I um, in Verdun, the sense of achievement I got out of, it was, it was, it was two rides. Um, I, I did the London night ride literally the day before France started, which was bad planning on my part. <laughs> but the sense of achievement I got, I went, I'm going to be a cyclist. What can I do in cycling? That's something to write him about. And I'd missed the encatchment deadline for the Invictus Games of 2017. So I just went, and this is 2016, this ride. So it was, it was a following year. So I went, Invictus game is 2018. Let's go. For those that don't know, can you explain what the Invictus games are? The Invictus games, um, for the uninitiated, <laughs> uh, it, the best way to describe it is like a Paralympic style event um, set up by Prince William, uh, Prince Harry, sorry, for members of the military and the veteran community. Um, and its sole purpose is uh, to give people... Uh, 
a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, you know, to a community, represent their country on an international level. Um, I guess in a way it's it's part of a recovery journey. If you're turning up just to win medals and that's it, you know, you're you're in you're in you're in the wrong game because you're competing against people who are have their own motivation for doing it. If that's what you want, well then go to the professional routes and do it, you know, apply for the Paralympics. I had moved into my flat in Ballam at this point. Um, I had this, I had this, this Scott Speedster entry level road bike, um, and yeah, rent was paid every month and all my bills. I had no money for fancy bits. I mean, the kit that I used to buy was cheap and cheerful finds on Amazon, um, like thirty quid for a pair of shorts and a jersey, and it looked like it when it arrived as well. But <laughs> I, I, I had no. I mean, luxury to me was being able to afford a pair of, you know, other branded bib shorts of well-known companies. Yeah. And your turbo as well, you were My saying. turbo trainer, yeah. So um, I just alluded to a minute ago about saying having the kicker. When I first started, I had a wheel-on uh, turbo trainer, which I managed to haggle for a fiver um, that if it broke, I, I had to... And it did break through wear and tear. I had to, um, I had to learn how to fix it. I had to YouTube and Google and all sorts. And it's not the easiest things to find. I couldn't even afford a Zwift membership, which is thirteen pounds a month. That was a luxury that I couldn't afford. So I figured, do you know what? And this just goes back to the controllables: what you can control, what you can't control. Well, I can't control having Zwift. But I pay for my internet every month. YouTube and Google are free. And that's how I found a GCN. They had indoor training videos. And so I would ride along. I didn't have power meter or anything. So I figured if it was a high power number, well, I put it into the hardest gear and then ride until I can't breathe anymore. <laughs> um, and I used to use Richmond Park was my local park in Ballum. And that was my indicator of fitness. I used to, there's a, there's a segment in Richmond Park called Tour de Richmond Park. Yeah, and I think the record for it stands at like 13 minutes. Is, it, is that for a lap? A lap. Yeah. And, and every week I used to go to Richmond Park um, on a Saturday or a Sunday and I'd go around it and then I'd, I'd do a lap. And, you know, I've, I've, not, I've not looked at my Strava, but I think the quickest I've ever done it and this is probably, this is more recently before I left London. It was something like just under seven, just under 17 minutes or just over one of the two. Um, when I started, it was like 30 minutes. Yeah. And every week I used to better my time. And so that's what I would do. It's like, well, that works. We'll keep doing that then. And it was the Invictus Games for 2018 was a two year process. And I threw myself into this, 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 I just used to copy the pros. What are they eating? Well, I'll eat the same. Well, I lived on chicken, broccoli and rice for like two years, pretty much, because I saw some bodybuilders were eating and whatnot. And I lost a lot of weight and I got better and better at cycling, you know, and over the course of that time, um, I, yeah, I, 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 I found myself in Sydney you know, on the start line for the Invictus Games time trial and the criterium. So, yeah. And it was really... That was, it wasn't about, I, I didn't go to win medals. They would have been nice. I didn't win any. Um, it was a multi, it was two fundamental factors for me was, can I do it? And uh, it was like a line in the sand between that part, the military part of my life, like closing that chapter and, and, and moving on with my life. So you did a ride across America. The race. Yeah, so that was that was after the game. So the game was finished in 2018, and I needed another goal. I had a goal. I I wanted. I was trying to go down the Team GB route for the para the paracycling. So I got classified. So I'm a C5. What C does that mean? C5. Um, when you look at para sports, um, they're categorised into numbers. So cycling is C, and then there's there's five levels. Five being the least impairment one being the most right um and you can you can you can see what you like about the system there's nothing better than it um 
if you had a category for every single nook and cranny, you'd need longer than a week to host the games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, when I got told I was C5, and I was really pumped about being C5 as well. I went to Derby, uh, you know, did it with British Cycling. We got the C5. And uh, th- I had a few friends. He said, uh, he said, how are you C5? Well, that's what they told me. I'm, I'm not going to argue with you. I, I don't know. But they went, but you can't use a prosthetic arm. And you can't stand up. So you're literally at a detriment to other C5 cyclists. That's what they're giving me. I, I'm not going to argue with it. And, and yeah, I am. Yeah, I, can't, I can't, you know, I've just got the one working arm and hand. So yeah, standing up is out for me. But it, it, it is what it is. But um, so I had the goal of Team GB. Uh and that's, that's obviously on a four-year cycle. So then I needed something else as well. And I'd heard about I'd heard about Race Across America. Um, and an opportunity came around probably in twin, in in the in the early part of 2019, or the middle of 2019. Um I was I, I ended up getting put in touch with charity. Well, I'm a beneficiary of actually Blesma, the British Limited Tech Servicemen's Association. And um, would I be interested in, in, in being part of a team? And they were going for Race Across America 2020. Which presumably didn't happen due to COVID. Because of what? Because of COVID. What's that? <laughs> uh, <I don't> <laughs> you actually had me, eh? I know. I was like, is it my accent? <laughs> ah, Zen. Back in the room. Yeah. No, no. Um, uh, yeah, 2020 yeah, obviously didn't happen because of the pandemic. Um, so I figured that... that it was floated to go for 2021. Um, so I was like, right, okay, well, I've now got a year to train. To train, And then obviously travel restrictions. So 2021 became 2022, Ram 22. So I was just like, it was two years to train. Two years to train. You can take the worst cyclist you can find and in two years make them into something pretty good. So uh, that's, what, that's what I did. Did Race Across America. That was amazing. We didn't finish officially. There are various factors at play for that. Um, you know, within the first 12 hours, our RV was written off at, before the first time station. Um, so we had a, we had an eight-man team. There's only ever one cyclist on the road at any one time. So the team split into two pods. And the two pods pepper pot across the country. Within the pods, each cyclist is pepper potting across during their, during their shift, if you like. Um, within... The first 12 hours, our t- uh, team RV, which is our living quarters, so the team that weren't on were, were, were admin in, you know, hot, you know um, cleaning and stuff and maintenance, eating, sleeping, ready for their turn. That was written off in, in the, the desert of Borrego Springs, uh, like the Arizona desert. Um, it, it had a blowout. The co- it was a coach. It had a blowout. And the, and the tire ripped off of the fuel tank. So 45 gallons of diesel leaked out into the desert floor. Oops. So that was written off. We then lost our team captain. Uh, he, he hit a, uh, a rumble strip, threw him off. I think he was doing about 40 k's an hour. Um, and he got airlifted to San Diego and where he spent the next four weeks. And so I then became team captain. Um because of that, and so you know, so we we'd, we'd hemorrhage quite a bit of time in trying to replan, um, replan replan the race. Um, it ended up being a day and a half altogether, um, but uh, you kind of I think as a team captain, I had to take away my my personal motivations of wanting to get to the end and and whatnot because I've now got bigger things to think about, which is the team and each individual member of the team. Um, and I, yeah, it, it, when you're put into a lead, this is why I've always said being in a, in a position of leadership is a privilege. It is a privilege. You, know, you, you, you get it because you've got the right, you've got the right kind of values to do it. And if you're going there because you want to throw your weight around it, get out, it's not for you. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a case of ensuring that everyone had a, had a, had, a, had, a, had a good experience, you know. So that was Race Cross America. What are you training for now? 
So I'm I'm training for um I'm dipping my toe into the world of ultra endurance and supported racing. So it's uh it's called Via. Um Via Hanabalis. It is a race which tra which traces the route of uh Hannibal, uh who was a Carthagin I can't pronounce it. Uh, Carthaginian it's not even a right. Don't quote me on it. It's, it, it was a general you get in, a Roman em, in a Roman time. This times. is a podcast. You get <laughs> quoted. <Yeah. laughs> uh, so who who marched his army of thirty eight elephants and his army <laughs> to Rome um, from southern Iberia to Rome? I'm I'm going to guess. So based on that, I would guess that that's probably about four thousand kilometers. Yeah. How did you know that? <laughs> 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 I'm just, I'm just really good at geography. It's yeah, my thing. Lunch before we came to <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to approach it differently to someone that has two arms? So the beauty of a, this organization, having never been or never done or, or entertained the world of ultra endurance unsupported events is the organizers, um, a guy called Ian Toe, and his partner Ingeborg, they've made a point of making this open open categories. Mm -hmm. So, uh, paracyclists, gender, all of it. There's no barriers. There's gonna be things that I can and can't do. But what those or or, or do things differently. I mean, the obvious one is I can't stand up and cycle. So other than that i don't know i'm just gonna have to find out as i go um and i think you can overthink things until you're in a situation where you have to do them mm -hmm. i've got i've got a good coach i've got a coach who's also a a very successful uh who's riding it as well who's doing the ride as well but uh neil copeland his name is and uh so he's he's a wealth of knowledge i, re I rate that so you're basically just going to throw yourself into it and discover the challenges along the way and work work your way around them yeah pretty much yeah that's it that's it um i don't know if i'm going to enjoy it i don't know if something i'm going to do post carry it on I, I don't know but yeah it's it's i'm interested to, i'm interested to find out and this is what i mean about saying yes to opportunities i don't know if i'll be good at it i'm just doing it to finish it i, yeah. I don't care if i come last mid of the field i'm certainly not coming you know top 10 but i think for me it's about i love to show that limitations aren't limited you haven't got to be disabled to know what a limitation is but i guess it's a way i motivate myself so you ride bikes yeah you got one arm yeah some people are going to want to know how you do that have you got an adapted bike what do you have to do differently with riding that to someone that has two arms? Because presumably you've got one control. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got one control, function at, fun, functionally and aesthetically. So there's not like one for for show. Yeah, yeah. So I, so my first, my, my, my the bike that I did the games and the race of on before it was stolen um, was a Cervelo S3 rim brake bike, 2018 Cervelo S3. And, um, and all the adaption on that was it was it was Shimano Di2 full synchro. Do you know what full synchro is? Is that where it changes front and back? Yeah, d d dependent on where the chain is on the cassette. Yeah, so you just go, you press up, and it knows whether it needs to change at what yeah. point to change the front back. Yeah, so you have some autonomy of your gearing, um, and you can program it in. But um, yeah, that, it's a semi-automatic car basically. Um, and then the rim brake was, um, the, the, the brakes were, it was a device called, of all things, I've always found it quite funny, actually called a problem solver. <laughs> so yeah, I had that. And it's basically, it's a, a one, in, one in, two out. So you've got a cable goes from the lever mm -hmm. into the device, which I just have wrapped up into the bar tape. And then two came out. And it sounds a lot more complex than it actually is. It pulls the back brake fractionally quicker than the front. Yep. But that's just all to do with how you've got the the adjuster set up on the yep. on the, on the calipers. Um, but I never kind of looked at upgrading the bike until it was stolen um, because I didn't think there's anything for hydraulic disc adaptions. 
Um, evidently there is. So when it was when when the bike was stolen, um, Pearsons got in touch. So Pearsons are the oldest family-run uh, bike bicycle manufacturer in the world, 1860, and presumably pretty close to where you live. Not anymore. Or lived. They lived. Yeah. So they're based in Xing. Yeah. When I shared that my bike had been stolen, I put it on my story. It had blown up, like literally, it went viral, um, and. Um, through that, through that, uh, Pearson's got in touch. Will from Pearson's got in touch. And he was just like, I don't want to jump in your bike's grave. He said, but we'd love to <laughs> put something to give you. And I, my bike was insured with lacquer as well. Uh, if you're going to get into cycling, get insurance. <laughs> and I, so I, I partnered lacquer up with Pearson's. Lacquer paid what I had my bike insured for. And um, anything outside of that, Pearson's, you know, covered. Um, and so I got a nice new Pearson shift, which is, if anyone knows the brand, um, it was the kind of the redesign of their mind goes to 11 aero road bike. And through that, they also pulled in, uh, classified, uh, okay. the shifting company. Yeah. So, so it's, based out so of Belgium. It, so it changes via the hub and under load. Yeah. It's basically a planetary year. Yeah, they take the rear derailleur, get rid of it, and put it into the rear hub. Um, but it's, I mean, the whole thing, the hub weighs as much of a front derailleur, so it cancels itself out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's just for not, it just means as well, I have full autonomy over my entire gearing um, and the, the, the brake adaptions. So it's a company called Outbreaker Tech. Who have designed this thing, uh, this 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 thing? Um, it's a splitter, basically, a hydraulic splitter, um, designed specifically for paracyclists um, to give me hydraulic disc brakes. So now I can I can stop effectively in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, do you know what? Like that's something that gets on my nerves. Like these people that you know, oh no, disc brakes shit. Oh, Shut up. <laughs> Agreed. You've got nothing else to write about on social media. I'll find something. Oh, your rim brakes are the best. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> What's your stopping distance in the rain on your carbon wheels? Oh, it's just buy uh, But it's, uh, it's cheaper to buy a disc brake bike. <laughs> yeah. The, the, w- once you ride disc brakes, it's a choice to go back, isn't it? Yeah. So how do you keep yourself motivated? Because you've had lots of challenges to overcome and you've done a hell of a lot of things in your life what keeps you motivated what keeps you going what keeps you wanting to do more events i said years ago years and years ago that one day i'm going to die I'll, one day it's the only guarantee we've all got in life the only guarantee any one of us has got in life is that one day we'll die but we don't know how or when that will happen when i get put into my coffin I'm going in sideways, kicking and screaming, you know, what a ride. People say life is short. I don't think it is. I think life is not short. Time is, I think it, it, it's finite, absolutely. And I think if you can fit as much as you humanly, physically can to make, to make every day as, 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 as entertaining as you possibly can, whether you laugh at yourself or not, Absolutely. And so I just think that when I'm kind of old and decrepit, sat on my rocking chair with my wife in front of in front of the fire, talking about we do this now anyway. I was gonna you're basically describing me on a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> my wife, she's been through her own struggles before we met. And and we talk about how we got through various stages. I want to get to that point when I'm like in my nineties, old and decrepit, yeah, and laugh and joke about some of the things that I got up to. Oh, I know in my thirties and my forties and my fifties and my sixties and so on, because I think when we talk about the stuff we've done, you know, in our teens and in our twenties, we still laugh about it now, and I think that's what I look forward to. But the self-talk that I've got is, you know, and everyone has it where they're going to say, "You're not very good." You're sh- what are you doing this for? What are you doing that for? The voice telling you that you can't do something is a, why did he swore then? It's a liar. You can do anything you set your mind to. You really can. 
So it doesn't involve breaking the law, but like, um, or, or, or you know, or, or shitting on someone from a great height kind of thing. But you'll always have a million reasons of why you shouldn't do something. But there's always one reason why you should go with that. That's my one. What I should do via race because as a paracyclist, I can show to people what's capable, what what what's what's achievable in spite of limitations. And like I said earlier, you haven't got to have a disability, lose a limb, be paralyzed, or whatever the case may be, to know what a limitation is. And that's what motivates me. I, I, I'm about helping other people, inspiring other people to do things that they don't think they can. What I think is a really interesting thing about you is not only that you are motivated but you are clearly not afraid of failure or rejection. And I think some people struggle with motivation, but I think some people don't want to start something because they are afraid of a no or are afraid of not finishing. Yeah. How have you, that clearly, it doesn't feel like that's something that affects you. How do you deal with that? This goes back to the row. I could have, I could have given up if I wanted to, but then what have I learned about myself? Uh, so I think now... You can fail good, and equally you can fail really badly. Failing badly because you got a bit hard at the first hurdle, and then like throwing your hands up in the air, going, "Oh, I'm not going to bother." Um, equally, you can fail trying your absolute best, and I think it's in it's in it's in the good failures where you'll learn more about yourself. And so, I think never be afraid of failing ever, because. You can't expect to get something right having never tried something before. There's more to learn in failure than there is in success. In success, all you, all you know is what went well. And it's like, well, if you apply that next time round as well, you may or may not win the next time round. So I think failing is a humbling thing to go through. Equally, it's a good thing to go through. And I think it's what you achieve at the end of it. Does that sound like absolute that rubbish sorry. no no talk. Oh. no it doesn't at all i love how you censor yourself yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> there's also for anyone interested a really good podcast series called how to fail um, oh is there by a, a lady called elizabeth day who's a journalist and she basically interviews celebrities um authors loads of different people and she talks about their three biggest failures in life and ultimately the failure might be I didn't get on the rowing team, but actually the story is about what an amazing experience it, that was and how they grew as a person because of that, in quotes, failure. Someone else might see it as a failure, but actually it was a massive positive yeah. for them. So that's a really good podcast series to check out if you're interested in that. How to Fail. How to Fail with Elizabeth Day. It's oh, called, okay. yeah. I, I have, I've upset people quite a few times because I talk quite regularly about not finishing something doesn't have to be a negative thing. So if you do an event and you end up pulling it out, I don't see that as a negative as long as, you know, you are able to be constructive with it. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's ultimately intentionally trying to remind people that you don't always have to be perfect you don't always have to be on your a game you don't always have to finish everything that you do but that doesn't mean you can't grow and you can't like get better as as things go on but also you don't have to always grow um which is i i like hearing your side of the story as well because it's very different to how i approach things or how i have ended up approaching things yeah because i've definitely been the opposite in my life as well where i have absolutely destroyed myself because I refused to finish things. I did an ultra marathon around the Brecon beacons. Um, and nearly ref I did end up finishing that because I physically couldn't walk any further and I got pulled out of it. And I thought I was going to be airlifted off the side of a mountain. Thankfully I wasn't. Um, but that was the point where I refused. I was t so focused on the failure isn't an option that I, it, I took it too far. And as a result of that, I'm now the exact opposite and it upsets some people because I say a DNF is fine. There's no problem with a DNF. Um, you are a very positive person. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and presumably there are still low points and there are points where you don't want to continue. So how, how do you deal with them? How, how do you come out the other side still being positive when you know stuff doesn't work? 
you know, like like a great example is the ride across America and the the RV gets taken yeah. out. That's like it, it's very easy in that scenario to go. Well, we don't have a mode of transport, so we'll just wind it up. Let's let's that that over with. Yeah, it ended up being a bit of an adventure, really. That that whole thing. It went from being a, a race to an adventure. I think everyone took something from that. Everyone everyone grew in confidence in their abilities and so on. Um, but yeah, for me, it was a very bitter pill to swallow because I uh, personally, I had trained hard for that. I knew what was coming up. I researched the event as well. I, I mean, the clues in the name, the world's toughest bicycle race. So, you know, clues in the name for that. Equally, there were members of the team that hadn't trained at all, if enough. Um, and yeah, I stayed positive that I had to. I became the team captain. It wasn't about me anymore. It was about the other people. And so in a way, yeah, it has... I think I've worked it out. You evolve your objectives. Yes. yes. That's the perfect way of that. that. You, you allow the, the actual goal to change and therefore it doesn't become destructive. Yeah. Do you know what? I've never, I've never, that, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> I evolve, what's it? I evolve the outcomes. <laughs> evolve the objectives. Evol evolve the objectives. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Because the, the, by this, yeah, ultimately the goal is what's changing. You're allowing that to adapt, which means that you're not creating a scenario which is bad. And I think a lot of, not a lot of the time, I think in some scenarios, people get into things and they set goals that mean that they do bad things to themselves or, or, or whatever, in whatever capacity, whether they just go too far, they create a dangerous situation. Um, whereas being able to adapt the goal, for example, you might be fit enough to podium event, but if in an event something goes wrong, I would imagine you go, well, now I'm happy just finishing it. And then if there's a scenario where you can't finish it, you probably like, well, and now I'm happy as long as I achieve, I inspire someone off the back of it. That, I, feel, I feel like that's what you do in these scenarios. But I also don't think you've not finished something yet. No, I haven't. I, <laughs> I haven't, no. I'd be interested to have yeah. a chat with you after the VIA race. Yeah, because uh, it's there's a lot that can go wrong in those races, and there's a lot of people which do end up DNFing. And obviously, I don't want you to DNF. Yeah, uh, but it'll be really interesting because inevitably, the more events you do, the higher the chances are there's going to be something that you can't overcome in terms of you actually finishing the the event. It's yeah. like the stuff outside of your control. Exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm I'm interested to see how you end up dealing with those situations, and I think you'll deal with it really, really well. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've 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 got a good way of looking at things and uh, like you do. I, I'm the, I'm the, I'm I'm the voice of reason at home. Me and my wife, we're each other's voice of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but she's even said like I, I just love how you stay so calm in 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 situations like you know it's um, you just got to weigh it up, haven't you? Like okay, well this bit sorry, this bit's not very good. <laughs> I know. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't swear, kids. We'll wash your mouth out with soap. Um, um, can't do that anymore, can you? <laughs> um, but um, you sounded like my nan for a minute. <laughs> happened to me once. Um, oh, Jesus. And um, and uh, I think when something when the chips are down, well, what chips aren't down? Let's let's deal with them. Let's use them ones. Um, so yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I have good days. I have bad days. My my life is no bigger or better than anyone else because I've got one arm and I'm dealing with life with one arm. Um, when people tell me that I'm inspirational and this is something I've got, disability community will probably murder me for this. But there's a thing within the disabled community where people don't like being called inspirational, mm -hmm. and that's fair enough. But 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 it gets really hammered home. The thing is, that comes from a place of love. That comes from a place of positivity. And if 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 so, if you're doing normal things, but just getting on with life and smashing through it, in spite of what's wrong with, in spite of the limitations you've got, right? If someone takes inspiration from that, who might be, you know, feeling really bad about themselves and might need that pickup, 
why is it a bad thing? Someone tells me I'm inspirational, I appreciate the compliment. And that's, that's, that is exactly what it is. But yeah, I'm, 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 I hear it a lot. Like, I'm not your inspiro, I'm not, I'm not your inspo porn. <laughs> All right. It is, it goes without saying that I am so confident that you've inspired tons and tons of people. Uh, you definitely have inspired me because you constantly post stories of you on the turbo and I'm like, <laughs> fine, I'll get on the turbo then as well. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, and I very much look forward to seeing how you get on with your race later this year. And if you do, if you do happen to not uh, achieve it and you end up DNFing, I also want to have a chat with you about that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, it's been good. No, no, it's been, it's, it's, it's been good to meet you guys actually and come along and, Gob off, innit? <laughs> uh, how many how many batches have you been through on your camera? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this this may be the longest podcast we ever put out. Oh. But um I think it'll be a very worthwhile one. I hope it's one. worth the uh the watch time. Absolutely. YouTube, I hope yeah. it's worth the missed train that you've now uh missed. But we will uh, we'll get you home, <laughs> we promise. <laughs> So that's all for this week. But before we go, our next two guests on the podcast are bike mechanic Nick and cycling coach James. And we want a bunch of questions to ask them. So you already know Nick by now, but James is an elite cyclist, a professional cycling coach, and has a special interest in sports psychology and motivation. So send us any questions for Nick and James to wildonespodcast at cavemedia.co.uk. Thank you for listening. And thanks to Dan for sharing his story. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Thingy Majiggy, whatever it's called, and wherever else you listen, it helps us grow the podcast. And if you're watching, leave us a like. Don't forget to subscribe so you do not miss out on the next episode. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>